Hello, YouTubers and NFL fans everywhere. This is Matt, the NFL fanatic, giving you my Week 5 2019 NFL predictions. Well, for the fanatic this week, it was a very uh, disappointing week, um, especially in the straight-up department. For the first time in the few, few years that I've done against the spread and straight-up picking, I actually ended up with a better against the spread record. Then I did a then I did a straight up record that this week so far. Um, so so far for this uh, for this past week, I am eight and six against the spread and straight up. You can invert that. That is my straight up record for this week at six and eight. Definitely the lowest amount of total points or total games that I've got right this whole year. And uh, definitely it was one of the weirdest weeks um, that I've seen in a long time. Uh, overall for the year now, I am now against the spread 36-24-1 against the spread and 38-23-1 straight up. So that equals about 60% against the spread and about 62.1% straight up. So definitely going from that 70% after week one or week two to getting the 62%, I'm definitely going in the wrong direction. And I'm hoping with this uh, slate of games this week, I can uh, definitely improve that uh, going upward uh, in a much higher rate because the rate of my uh, straight up record is going down at a pace that I do not like and I wish to uh, stop and hopefully this week I can boost it up very well uh, but overall though and one last time I'm going to tell everybody I am taking the Steelers tonight straight up but I am take I'm taking the Bengals plus four uh, so that's my pick for uh, tonight's game and yeah it was just a really weird week where a lot of the upsets, a lot of teams that I thought were going to do well didn't do so well. And others, you know, overplayed or underplayed their hands. Such as, I'm going to give the Cleveland Browns congratulations uh, for their 40-25 to win over the uh, Baltimore Ravens. Basically, after the Ravens had gone down and scored a touchdown with uh, Lamar Jackson throwing it to Mark Andrews and then getting a two-point conversion run with Mark Ingram, Nick Chubb then decides to, on the very uh, next play after the kickoff, run 88 yards down the left sideline to put the Browns back up by 13, and that was the end of the game at that point. And then Lamar Jackson threw two big turnovers. Uh, the second one really didn't matter, but it was just an unraveling there. I do want to congratulate the Browns. They are in first place in the AFC North for the first time. Um, probably maybe maybe ever in the division. I, I, I don't know, maybe 2 at some point, but it has to be either 2002 or 2007, the last time the Browns were in first place in the AFC North. When you look at some of the other games, the Atlanta Falcons, I mean, what what can you say about the Falcons and Titans? The Falcons have all this talent with uh, Devontae Freeman, Matt Ryan, Julio Jones, Calvin Ridley, uh, Muhammad, uh, Muhammad Sanu, Austin Hooper, Grady Jarrett, Deion Jones, Vic Beasley, Desmond Trufant, and all, all, all the other great secondary and offensive weapons, and they only could put up 10 points against a Titans team. They gave up 20 to the Gardner Minshew-led Jaguars the week before, and they just can't stop anybody. And I'm looking at this Falcons team as one of the biggest disappointments all year, and I really do want to ask any Falcons fan out there, shout out to Hatbox, fellow YouTube NFL YouTube prognosticator, how you doing, man? You know, you got a $150 million quarterback that you're paying about $5.7 million per win under his contract so far. Dan Quinn and his defense really can't stop anybody. And this Falcons team is just way too talented. And also the Titans, again, just like I predicted, um, would continue to show that every time you bet on the Titans, expect them to fail. And every time you doubt the Titans, they'll play one of their better games. That's what the Titans did on yesterday. So congratulations to them. A few of the other games, Carolina-Houston. I want to congratulate Kyle Allen for being only the third quarterback in NFL history to start 3-0 with three straight starts on the road. The other two were Patrick Mahomes and Jeff Hofstetter. So I do want to congratulate him for that. But if you're the Texans, how do you give up? How, how do you lose that game? I mean, the Panthers, offensively... J.J. Watt and the Texans, I think, forced two or three turnovers themselves. So it wasn't like the Texans just kept turning the ball over. No, the Panthers did too. 
but it was just, you know, there was also that dumb play where they had DeAndre Hopkins throwing the football. They really couldn't run the ball. Kenny Stills went out with an injury. And it was just a bizarre game that, you know, kudos to Kyle Allen. And again, for all Panthers fans out there, I think Cam Newton, you know, of his injury, let him take as much time as he wants to heal because I do not think the Panthers need Cam Newton. And again, in, in the last 11 games, they're 3-8. and eight. They're 3-0 and oh with Kyle Allen. They're 0-8 with Cam Newton. So as long as this continues to roll, I'm just telling you, Cam Newton may be expendable or should be expendable by the end of this year. And maybe you should let Kyle Allen uh, take over the reins if this keeps going. But we will see. Um, so I thought that was weird. Uh, the Rams giving up 55 points to Tampa Bay Buccaneers. A franchise record for them, by the way. And they're, that's the most point the Rams have given up defensively since 1956. And it was just a bizarre game where Jared Goff had three picks and a fumble. And it was just awkward. He threw 63 times. He threw for over 400 yards. But every time the Rams tried to make a, you know, a good run of it, you know the Bucks would just go right back down the field and score quickly. I thought that was a nuts game. And the clown the clown game for me, and I will take all the critics, uh, was, tr- was trusting Kirk Cousins in a big-time game against the Bears. And even when Mitchell Trubisky going down... The Bears actually looked better with Chase Daniel, and Kirk Cousins got sacked five times. He had two or three fumbles forced. He only threw for 233 yards. He really couldn't do anything offensively. And when Adam Thielen says, well, you know, it's one of these days you have to be able to throw the football, that is a pretty <laughs> glaring and damning incident of uh, criticism from your wide receiver. If you're, He's basically saying, well, you have to throw the ball. That was a Veiled shot directed at Kirk Cousins. So, you know what? Congratulations to the Bears. I think with Chase Daniel, I think I read something where he's only started four games in his career. But he's made a grand total of $34.1 million. You know, job well done. But I think Chase Daniel, you are gonna you have a very similar Jay Cutler, Josh McCown, 2013 incident here where the older veteran guy is better than the young guy that they really want to try to build their future around. And I think Chase Daniel can go on a Case Keenum, McCown-type run to where he can get the Bears, he gives the Bears a better chance to get to the Super Bowl compared to Trubisky. I hope Trubisky's okay, but this injury, I hope you know, I, I hope he gets fully recovered. But I think his injury may be a better thing for the Bears uh, than they think. Um, just with Chase Daniel being there, because I think Chase Daniel was an effective manager and one of the better backups in the league, especially with his history with Matt Nagy. All right, so time for my picks and thoughts on each game. So this Thursday. When the 3-1 Los Angeles Rams go to the 3-1 Seattle Seahawks to battle possibly for first place in the NFC West on the line. This game is a pick'em game right now. So that so I'm going to take the Seattle Seahawks against the spread and the Seattle Seahawks straight up. Then the next game, when the 0-3-1 Arizona Cardinals go to the 0-4 or 1-3 Cincinnati Bengals. The Cincinnati Bengals are 4.5 point favorites in this game. I'm going to take Cincinnati here straight up to win, but I'm going to take Arizona plus four and a half. Then the next game, when the 3-1 Buffalo Bills go to the 2-2 Tennessee Titans, the Tennessee Titans are two-point favorites in this game. I like the Titans here to win straight up, but I'm going to take the Bills plus two against the spread. Then the next game, when the 3-1 Chicago Bears go to the 2-2 Oakland Raiders, even though that game is technically not a home game for the Raiders, it's in London. The... Bears are five-point favorites in this game. I like Chicago here, minus five, and Chicago straight up. Then the next game, when the 2-2 two two Tampa Bay Buccaneers go to the 3-1 and one New Orleans Saints, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers are five-and-a-half-point dogs in this game. I like the Saints here to win straight up, but I'm going to take the Tampa Bay Buccaneers plus five-and-a-half. Then the next game, when the 2-2 two and two Minnesota Vikings go to the 2-2 two two New York Giants, the Minnesota Vikings are four-and-a-half-point favorites in this game. As much as I don't want to take Kirk Cousins after how bad he performed yesterday afternoon, after looking at what the Giants did, you know, job well done to Daniel Jones, uh, you know, even though he did have two early turnovers, and that was just more of the Redskins just being bad, in my opinion, and Daniel Jones, the offense being good. You know, shout out to Wayne Gallman, too, having career high in receiving and rushing yards. I know Saquon was out, but job well done to him. I'm going to have to take the Vikings here, minus four and a half, and the Vikings straight up. Then the next game, when the 0-3 New York Jets go to the 2-2 Philadelphia Eagles, 
The Philadelphia Eagles are 14-point favorites in this game. I like Philadelphia here, minus 14, and Philadelphia straight up. Then the next game, when the 2-2 two two Baltimore Ravens go to the 1-3 or 0-4 Pittsburgh Steelers, the Ravens are four-point favorites in this game. I like the Ravens here to win straight up, but I'm going to take Pittsburgh plus four. Then the next game, when the 4-0 New England Patriots go to the 0-4 Washington Redskins, the New England Patriots are 14.5-point favorites in this game. I like the New England Patriots here, minus 14.5, and, and the New England Patriots straight up. And then in the game of backup QB manias, you're going to have Minshew Mania and the Jacksonville Jaguars that are 2-2 two two going to the 2-2 two two Kyle Allen-led Carolina Panthers. The Panthers are 3.5-point favorites in this game. I am doing the ultimate hedge here. I really don't know who's going to win, but I'm taking the Panthers here straight up, uh, and I will take the Jags plus 3.5. This out of all the games is the ultimate hedge to me, <laughs> where honestly you, you, you could take the Panthers minus 3.5, you could take the Jags plus 3.5, you could take Jacksonville, Carolina. That That's literally a toss-up to me in that one. Uh, but yeah, so I'm going to hedge my bet. I don't know uh, who, what backup quarterback's going to play better, but I'm going to take the Panthers um, in this one straight up and against, uh, but I'm going to take the Jags against the spread. The next game, when the 1-3 and three Atlanta Falcons going to be 2-2 two and two Houston Texans, the Texans are five-point favorites in this game. I like Houston near minus five, and Houston straight up. Then the next game, when the 0-4 Denver Broncos go to the 2-2 two two Los Angeles Chargers, the... Chargers are six and a half point favorites in this game. I like Denver here plus six and a half, um, but I'm going to take the Chargers straight up. The next game, when the three and one Green Bay Packers go to the three and one Dallas Cowboys, and what I believe is the game of the week, uh, the Dallas Cowboys are four point favorites in this game. I like Green Bay here for the upset outright, so I'm going to take Green Bay here plus four and Green Bay straight up. Then the Sunday night game, when the two and two Indianapolis Colts go to the four and zero Kansas City Chiefs. The Chiefs are 10-point favorites in this game. I think people are kind of overreacting to Indy a bit, and people do need to see, you know, people do need to see how well the Lions did offensively, um, even though there were a lot of fumbles, which you could, you could definitely say that was in factor. But that's too many points for me. I'm going to take the Chiefs here to win straight up, um, but I'm going to take Indianapolis plus 10. Then the Monday night game when the 2-2 two two Cleveland Browns are going to be 4-0 San Francisco 49ers. The San Francisco 49ers are three-point favorites in this game. But just like with a lot of the games this week, I really could see maybe Cleveland, if they, if they have some confidence, playing well. So I took Cleveland here plus three, but I took San Francisco straight up. So, um, And there's my pick there. Definitely this week, um, to me, after everything that I've seen, there are a lot of games between evenly matched teams with a lot of the injuries where you can genuinely say, hey, Tampa could beat New Orleans. The Giants maybe could beat the Vikings. Carolina and Jacksonville, same way. Green Bay and Dallas is that way. And even Cleveland, San Francisco is that way where you genuinely really, you know, you really can't grasp that much with both teams. But that's what, so that's why I feel like I had to hedge a lot of my bets. Just because of just how close a lot of these games are, in my opinion, just from what I've seen from the first quarter of the year. And one last thing before I go into my explanations, the buys this week are for the Detroit Lions and the Miami Dolphins. And uh, by the way, Miami, congratulations, you've scored now a grand total of 26 points. I think, I think they said you've been outscored 163 to 26. I do have to give the Dolphins credit for at least, you know, 60, 65% of that game against the Chargers. They were in the game, and then eventually the Chargers just ended up kind of just playing more effective Charger football. It got them in a position to win, but yeah, so... Definitely uh, a rough spin for Miami there, so enjoy the break. And for the Lions, you know, a 2-1-1, one, and one, they're, they're an underrated team. And I think through the first quarter, the Lions are going to stay around this year to play good football throughout the whole year. All right, so time for my thoughts on each game. The Seahawks over the Rams. This one is really one where I took the Seahawks because if you look at how the Seahawks have played... They held. They were held. To, they only held the Saints' offense to 19 points. Two of those TDs were from Von Bell uh, fumble return touchdown from Chris Carson and a Deontay Lewis returning a touchdown in the first play of the game 
or, or first offensive play, play of the game for the Saints. I look at what the Seahawks are doing. They have a top 10 offense and a near top 10 defense. I thought they played a very solid game against the Cardinals overall. Uh, they sacked Kyler Murray, I believe, four four times. A couple more. Russell Wilson's leading the league in completion percentage. It's 72.6. He still hasn't thrown an interception. Yeah, I think he has the second fewest turnovers in the league by any quarterback that started every game. And I just... They also have the sixth best run defense, which going up against the Rams is a huge factor because Todd, Todd Gurley only had, I believe, 20... They, the Rams only had 28 total rushing yards last Sunday against Tampa. And the, the Rams have the 10 forced running defense in the league. And with guys like Chris Carson and Rashad Penny, who they love to use, I think the Seahawks can definitely gash the Rams enough to control the clock. I think Jared Goff, with the limited uh, with the limited ability of Todd Gurley, he's leading the leagues with, with six turnovers. I believe he's fumbled a couple more times as well. And Aaron Donald, uh, who, you know, the reigning defensive player of the year, this year only has six solo tackles and one sack. So this is a Rams defense that's not really getting, a, getting home to a lot of pressure. And I here's the thing. Do I think Seattle is going to put up 55 points? No, I do not. But do I think Seattle can put up enough points on this Rams defense with how they're playing? And do I think the Seahawks can get some turnovers from the Rams? Sure, because Jared Goff has at least had uh, one or two turnovers in, I think, every game this year so far. Maybe not maybe not the Saints game. I think he's had one or two turnovers in every game. So the Seahawks can expect a turnover. And I just think Russell Wilson who's playing some of the most efficient football he has played in his whole career through a quarter of the year, uh, can manage this game, win it well, and I don't think the Rams are going to be able to stop the Seahawks running attack. You know, and I know it's going to be a hard feat because the Rams only lost back-to-back games one time under Sean McVay, but looking at Taylor Rapp going down, looking at how limited Gurley's usage has been, and looking at how bad the Seattle, or looking at bad the Rams secondary has played uh, throughout the whole year, I know the Seahawks don't have Mike Evans or Chris Godwin or OJ Howard, but they have competent enough weapons that Russell Wells can make big chunk plays, especially with that crowd noise in Seattle. They're looking for their first win against the Rams, I believe, in Seattle for the first time since sixteen, because I know they lost three of the four in Seattle over the last four years. But I'm going to take Seattle here because I trust their running game a little better. Their defense is playing okay. And I just don't think Jared Goff, with the weapons he has around him, he's not going to be able to make as many throws. If you take down, if you take out Cooper Cup, I don't think he'll be able to generate as much throws. And I, I think they're going to be one-dimensional through the Seahawks' sixth best run defense, which will be the end of the game for the Hawks. Could I see the Rams winning this game? Absolutely. Because the Rams, you know, they could wake up. Uh, the Seahawks' defense has been awful <laughs> through the secondary this year. They gave, they've given up plenty of chunk plays and plenty of big games to Andy Dalton, Kyler Murray, you know, Teddy Bridgewater. And they're, and the Seahawks have shown that in big moments, they sometimes can be uh, one, some of the most undisciplined teams in the league. But I'm going to trust the quarterback here, trust the running game, trust Seattle's six-ranked run defense to hold girly enough So. It's on Jared Goff's arm, and I don't think Jared Goff will be able to make enough plays against the Seattle defense to win this game, especially with such a short turnaround for them coming from L.A. to Seattle in only three days. So that's why I like Seattle here against the spread in a pick and Seattle straight up. The next game, the Bengals over the Cardinals. This is one where Kyler has been the most sacked QB in the NFL this year at 20 sacks. Arizona's also given up 27 or more points in three of their four games. And I, I do want to say very quickly, though, congratulations to Larry Fitzgerald for becoming the second all-time leader in receptions. Uh, only about 240 away, or to about 240, I think, away from Jerry Rice from number one all-time. Congrats to Larry Fitzgerald, a model player, one of the best of all time, and a job well done. Especially, he is the modern-day Tim Brown. Because he's caught balls, I believe, from 21 or 22 different quarterbacks in his career. But, you know, job well done to him. 
And again, it's just I think it's it's hard for me to I, I think the Bengals can generate pressure through their offensive line. I think the Bengals offensively, I know they have the worst rushing attack in the league, but I think they can run through. Uh, I think Mixon uh, and Bernard can make some plays through the Bengals defense. I don't know if AJ Green will be able to play, which would be a big plus or minus. But I just I, what I've seen out of Cincinnati is this: is that with John Ross having a career year, Tyler Boyd making effect, somewhat effective plays, and Tyler Reifert be, still being healthy, I've seen the Bengals play well enough offensively, that offensive line generating a push, that I've seen the Bengals in closer games uh, than I've seen the Cardinals. You could say, well, they tied and they almost beat Baltimore, and then they got basically decisively lost against Seattle and Carolina. But that's the thing. In the three games I've seen with Cincinnati, Cincinnati should have beaten Seattle, if you think about it. They could have almost beat Baltimore, and then, or I'm sorry, Cincinnati should have beat Seattle, and they could have beat Buffalo if it wasn't for an Andy Dalton late pick to Tredavious White. So I, I've seen more consistency of closeness compared to the Cardinals in these games, and I think again the Bengals be competitive against Pittsburgh tonight, and I just think again the offensive line is going to be the difference. I think the Bengals defensive line will be able to generate more pressure, and the Cardinals uh, defensive line will against the Bengals' offensive line. Really wish Jonah Williams was playing uh, their first-round pick from Alabama. Um, I think it's it should be an interesting game, but again, this, like I said this week, this game is so close, I just had to think... I wouldn't be surprised if Arizona won. I think Cincinnati has shown that they've had lower lows, but I'm going to take the Bengals here. They're home. They have a little, I think they have a little bit of a better running game, and I trust their coaching staff with Zach Taylor a little more than I do Cliff Kingsbury at this point with how they're going to play. And... The Bengals can, I think, put up at least 20, 24 more points because, like I said, the Bengals, uh, the Cardinals defense has given up 27 more points in three of their four games this year already. So that's why I like the uh, Cardinals here plus four and a half. It'll take the Cincinnati Bengals straight up. The next game, the Titans over the Bills. This one, um, shout out to Keith Bailey for giving me uh, a fellow YouTube NFL YouTube prognosticator for giving me some stats here for the Titans themselves. They are 17 and three when they score 20 points, and they are or 20 points or more, and they are four and 14 when they are not able to since 2017. Marcus Mariota is also the only QB not yet to commit a turnover this entire year. When you look at the Titans here, you know AJ Brown had two receptions for about six. Uh, I think he almost had a hundred yard game and two receptions for 60 plus yards. Uh, the Titans got a couple big turnovers on the Falcons' defense. And Mariota threw for three touchdowns, 224 yards, and no picks. He had a very efficient and solid game. The only problem is is that I went against them. Every time that happens, it seems like over the last few years, that's what the Titans do. Whenever you pick the Titans, <laughs> they will play down and they will let you down at the end of the game where you're going, wow, uh, that shouldn't have happened. Or I can't believe they lost that game. And every t- But every time you go against them, you look at the Titans and go, that's a solid football team where they play, you know, they can run the ball. Mariota makes solid playmaking decisions. He can make plays. He finds his big receivers. And the Titans defense shows up. And amazingly, they were the... <laughs> they were one of the six worst running defenses, but one of the top five passing defenses. And... <laughs> Devontae Freeman only had 28 yards, or, you know, Devontae Freeman, I think, only had 28 yards rushing the entire game. So, you know, I like the Titans here because the one thing about Buffalo is this. Buffalo, look, sensationally defensively, uh, the fifth-ranked total defense, second in yards. Uh, They also have the fourth-best rushing offense. I want to give Frank Gore a lot of credit for uh, passing that milestone. He's about... 200, you know, a little bit, about 200 plus yards away from getting third all time, which would be sensational. If Devin Singletary continues to be out, I definitely think Frank Gore can reach that milestone. But my problem is, is that the Bills, they suffer two significant injuries, one to Tredavious White, their best corner, and the second one to Josh Allen, who left the game uh, with a uh, with a concussion. Matt Barkley, of course, ended up throwing the game, losing interception in New England. At the end of the game, and that's why I have to take the Titans. Just because I feel like the Titans, they're at home. Uh, the Titans are, I believe, 5-1 and one in their last six games against Buffalo at home. They're 6-3 and three in their last nine straight up total. 
And I just, I can't trust Josh Allen's health. And I'm just going to take Mariota with his performance. And if Jadavious White can't go, I think that definitely helps A.J. Brown. That helps Corey Davis. That helps Delaney Walker. It helps move up. It helps free up that Titan uh, defense. And I think that Derrick Henry can do an okay job against that Buffalo defensive line, which is very talented. And again, would I be surprised if Buffalo won this game? Not at all, because this is what the Titans do. I remember last year, I think, oh yeah, they played the Patriots last year, blew them out, and then lost the game the next week, 13-12 to to Tennessee, which basically re- re- reaffirmed everything I know about the Titans. So that's why I took the Bills here plus two, because I genuinely just am just going to go here and go, well, you know, I'm going to take the Titans to win straight up, but I'll take the Bills just to save myself uh, a, at least half a win if the Bills pull this out, which, again, I would not be surprised. But with Josh Allen being hurt, with Tredavious White being hurt, and just looking at what the Titans have offensively, they're a bit more healthier, and I really trust that pass defense with the limited offensive weapons Buffalo has uh, to win this game against the Matt Barkley-led um, Bills if it comes down to it. If Josh Allen does play... You know, maybe the Bills do win, but with how he played, having three picks, having 16 yards, do I think he'll put up better yards against the Titans? Absolutely, but do I think it'll be enough to win? No, and I'll trust Mariota not making mistakes as the one driving factor if it's Barkley or Allen to win this game. So that's why I like uh, the Titans here uh, straight up, but I'll take Buffalo plus two. The next game, the Bears over the Raiders. Uh, this is one that I call the Khalil Mack thanks John Gruden tour. <laughs> In the sense that the Bears defense, who did not have Akeem Hicks, who did not have Roquan Smith, who did not have a few of their other defenders through that defensive line. I think they were playing Nick Williams and Roy Robertson Harris for their two main starting defensive linemen. They ended up getting five sacks on Kirk Cousins. Two or three forced fumbles. They held Dalvin Cook to, I believe, 40, 40 or 50 rushing yards total. And they held Kirk Cousins to throw for 233 total yards by the, uh, yeah, by the, uh, by the Vikings offense. Um, and that's just the thing where I looked at Chase Daniel. He played an effective game. But you're going up against the Raider team that got very fortunate of how bad the Colts' defense is. Uh, the Colts' defense, they, the Raiders got their first interception of the year for a pick six that that won them the game. And then now you have Derek Carr, who played an effective game. He, he didn't really make that many. Fabian Monroe and Tyrell Williams caught two big touchdowns. And I have to give Tyrell Williams his credit. He is playing like a number one receiver for the Raiders. So job well done to him. But... I do want to tell Raider fans out there two things. Number one, Khalil Mack is going to be coming for vengeance after what happened against uh, what happened to what John Gruden did to him uh, last uh, two years ago by trading him to Chicago. And uh, Derek, you know, you had a great time beating up the Colts defense, which didn't have Darius Leonard, which um, really isn't that depth of talent uh, in the secondary as much. You're playing a Bears defense that is much more ferocious, much more talented, and has much better. Uh, secondary play all across the board from Prince, uh, Kyle, Eddie, and Haha. And I just look at the Raiders. I remember, uh, I think the last last year the Raiders went to uh, London and they played Seattle and got absolutely thumped. I remember also that Dennis Allen several years ago was in Oakland. They went to London and the Dolphins thumped them. And he got fired after that game. So the Raiders' history in London has not been a very good one. <laughs> And I just genuinely look at with the uh, with the uh, with the Bears here that you know Chase Daniel can play effective enough football, and I just don't think the Raiders offensively will nearly be able to put up 24 points against this Bears offense or this Bears defense. And I think Chase Daniel with Fontes Burfitt now being out for the year due to a uh, suspension due to um, multiple unnecessary roughness penalties, which I do support by the way because. That Vontez Burford, that's just his M.O. That's what he is defined as by his play. Um, But yeah, I, I just look at with the Bears defense that got five sacks and three turnover or three, three forced fumbles on the Vikings. They can do the same thing to Derek Carr. 
and it's just going to be a rough day for the Bear, or rough day for the Raiders all around. And I think Chase Daniel can manage the game well enough with that defense, with the weapons he has offensively, to win this game pretty easily in, in a ugly affair for the Raiders. So that's like Chicago here, minus five. Uh, and Chicago straight up. The next game, the Saints over the Buccaneers. I have to give the Saints a tremendous amount of credit for their defense and how they played over the last two games. I don't think anybody expected them, at the very least, to be 2-0 and without Drew Brees once he went down in Week 2 of a thumb injury, and that's what they are, though, now. I, You know, if you look at what the Saints' defense did, they gave up 257 total yards um, against the Cowboys. They also had Zeke held to his third-fewest rushing yards in a game for his career, and I think one of the biggest thing is they've had four defensive turnovers in the last two games, uh, one of them was returned for a touchdown, and one key one was a huge one. It was the only time, only the seventh time in Jason Wynn's career that he lost a fumble and could not recover it. So it was just a sensational defensive performance, and I like what Teddy Bridgewater's been doing. 65.3% completion percentage, about 360 to 80 yards, 360 to 280 yards, TD and a pick, and uh, that one was just more of a, a tip ball that wasn't his fault. Awuzie ended up catching that one for his one pick there. And I was just really impressed, you know, with how the Saints have been playing. And I think the Saints, you know, they played their two toughest teams in Dallas and Seattle, the ones with the better quarterbacks. They're now going against the Tampa team that has definitely done a fantastic job um, the last two weeks. Jameis Winston, seven TDs, two picks, 765 yards through the air in the last two games. Um, he put up 55 points, which again was a franchise high for the Buccaneers themselves. And I think, you know, this is the Tampa offense and a Tampa team that if you look at a 500 team, they're running the ball a lot better. They are, um, uh, Mike Evans is having a career year. Shaq Barrett, a cast off from Denver, is only the fourth player in NFL history since sacks have been recorded to have nine sacks through four games. And he got the game winning sack turnover that Sue returned for a touchdown to win the game yesterday. So, and, you know, this Tampa team is just one Matt Gay kick and two Winston pick sixes for possibly being 4-0 and one of the best teams in the NFC. And I know that, you know, also last year in week one when Ryan Fitzpatrick went to the Superdome, that wasn't that wasn't a lot of fun, and he ended up beating Drew Reason's year at 48-40. So, Jameis Winston, you know, and the Bucks have, have at least recent history of just last year of being able to go into that Superdome and surprise people with a victory. The only reason why I'm not going with uh, the with with the Bucks in this game is just because that defense is way too talented uh, to, I, I, I think, give up that many points. They, the Bucks. Mike Evans dealt with a hand injury. I know he came back in the game, but you also have Brashad Perryman, who had a hamstring injury, and he'll be out. And I just I'm going to trust this Saints team to be able to effectively do the same type of things. I think they'll be able to run the ball. I think Teddy Bridgewater can manage games, and even though Winston may throw all over the field, um, which I, I don't think he'll be able to, I I just think Teddy Bridgewater will make more efficient and smart managing plays versus uh. Breeze and, uh, versus the Bucks and Winston. I know. I know. I think James has had a mixed bag in his career, and up to this year, I think he was four and twelve in the game since since that whole V for victory incident, which was in the Superdome. So James has had a rough time, and I, even though he's had a couple good games now, but I'm going to take the Saints here. A better defense, home field advantage. Teddy will make more effective plays, and Winston leads the league by the way with three pick sixes uh, for the year. So I think the Saints, they'll get a turnover, and I think they'll capitalize on it. And if it has to come down to a kicking uh, a kicking game, I'll trust Will Lutz over Matt Gay. But kudos to Matt Gay, though, for making a 58-yard field goal to get the Bucks within 11 at one point in the game. Um, but like I said, I'm taking Tampa here. This game is so close because I think Tampa Tampa is a solid 500 team, and they could definitely surprise the Saints. And with how the Saints are doing, I don't know if offensively they'll have, you know, they'll have to... They'll have to deal with a much bigger problem, Tampa offensively, versus Dallas and uh, 
Seattle they have over the last two weeks. So that's why I like New Orleans here to win straight up, but I will take Tampa Bay plus five and a half. The next game, the Vikings over the Giants. This is one where, you know, again, Kirk Cousins got sacked five times. He fumbled three times. The Vikings, they just didn't look that good at all. Now Kirk Cousins is 0-3 against the Bears. He's 3-5 and against the Giants all time. But the only reason why I'm taking the Vikings is because I looked at that Giants game, and kudos to Daniel Jones uh, for winning back-to-back games. I think that's the first, uh, you know, the nice job for him for getting, you know, some confidence there. He threw two picks early, but after that he played an okay game. I thought Evan Ingram had a solid game. He's going to get Golden Tate back this week, which would be a big thing. And it's the first time the Giants' defense has forced four turnovers since week six of 2015. But I just look at the Giants to say this. You know, kudos for them for winning and to get a back-to-back game winning streak um, for, I think, only the, you know, for the first time since, like, late 2018, which I don't think anybody expected. But this was, that was just really how bad the Redskins were. Dwayne Haskins went 9 of 17 for 107 yards and three picks. One of them returned for a touchdown. So, as well as the Giants did and Jawa done for getting back-to-back wins... You really should be 1-1 one one in those two games, and you played Washington, who was by far clearly the worst team in the NFC. Um, I think the Vikings, look, I, I think Dalvin Cook will be able to run against the Giants defense a little more effectively. I think that the Vikings defense will get Daniel Jones to make a couple more mistakes. And I don't think the Giants offensive line will be nearly as effective as the uh, Bears offensive line in protecting Daniel Jones from harassment from Evans. Everson Griffin, Daniel Hunter, uh, Jam- uh, Shamar Stevens, Linval Joseph, Everson Griffin, and, and all those guys in the, the Vikings defense. And I, I think with the secondary, with Harrison Smith, with Anthony Harris, with Xavier Rhodes, I think they'll be able to hold down the Giants offense stuff. That the, it's going to be a hard struggle. And I'll take Kirk Cousins in this game over Daniel Jones uh, just because I think the Vikings just have a much better defense. I think they'll be able to run the ball better against the Giants defensive line. And I don't I don't think Kirk Cousins will be as ineffective in a a game against a much more inferior team. I could be wrong though. It's Kirk Cousins, it's Daniel Jones. Maybe this hype is real. You know, maybe this confidence can build up against the Viking team that got absolutely shredded again. I'll, I'll say again, it's bad when your own wide receiver says, well. You know, we, eventually you're going to need to throw. And when you mention that your quarterback, that's never a good thing. Um, so that's why I like the Minnesota Vikings here. Minus four and a half. And the Minnesota Vikings straight up. The next game, the the Eagles over the Jets. This is one where Jordan Howard, who had 97 rushing yards and three total touchdowns, um, had the best game of his season Carson Wentz that was, I believe, 15 to 27 for 160 yards, three TDs, no picks. A very efficient game by him. And I want to give them credit for getting becoming the first team in 60 games to beat an Aaron Rodgers-led home team when he was up by 10 points. Or I guess an Aaron Rodgers-led Packer team that was up by 10 points was 59-0 entering the game, and the Eagles were the first team to lose or to get to give the. Uh, to give the uh, Packers a loss, and a little fun or a much more similar statistic, um, the, pa- uh, the Eagles also the first team I believe in 80 games to the Patriots for the same thing for Tom Brady in that same regard. It was the uh, 2015 game with Sam Bradford beating uh, the Packers 35-28, and this one they won the game 34-27. Um, and th- the reason why I'm taking the Eagles here is that look, I know their secondary, you know, is, is horribly mangled through injuries. They, Avante Maddox has another neck injury. Ronald Darby's out of a hamstring injury. Uh, Jalen Mills is out for the year. You have a lot of injuries down that secondary. Sidney Jones went out of the game against Green Bay. So that secondary is mangled. But you are playing the Jets, who are the, I believe, the second worst team in the AFC. Maybe the worst team in the AFC uh, when it all comes down to it, just with how ineffective they've been. The only bright spot they've had is Le'Veon. But that's the one thing with the Eagles, though, is that even though, you know, Sam Darnold may have a, have a throwing party, you know, 
on the Eagles secondary, they are not going to be able to run the ball as effectively. The Eagles have one of the better run defenses in the league. And I just think, again, with Darnold coming back, going into Philadelphia, it's not going to be that that long of a drive for the Jets. It's only down the turnpike to get to Philly. I just don't think there's really no chance, especially with the confidence they have beating beating the Packers, who everybody thought was one of the best teams in the NFC. And I still believe they are. I just don't have that much confidence in uh, the Jets, even with Darnold possibly coming back to win this game. And he's not even cleared for contact drills yet. The only thing he's not cleared for is non-contact drills. That was from Gase earlier today. <laughs> could the game be interesting? Sure. If Darnold could play, if the Jets, you know, defense can get their starters back and then get the pressure on once, sure, the game could be somewhat interesting. But I don't think that's going to happen. Or I don't think that's going to happen. I think it's going to be another Luke Falk game. And it, that just pretty much tells you the end of it there. Uh, in the two games that Darnold did not play in, the Jets have given up uh, 23 to the Browns, and they've given up 30 to, to the Patriots. I think the Eagles can put up definitely a good 27 or more, and that'll be way too much for Darnold to try to overcome. So that's like the Eagles here, minus 14, and the Eagles straight up. The next game, the Ravens over the Steelers. For the first time in the John Harbaugh era, the Ravens gave up 500 yards of total offense in back-to-back games, which is stunning, and I did not know that. Um, Lamar Jackson had his most consecutive pass attempt streak broken without a pick. Uh, streak snapped at about 279 passes. And you look at what happened with uh, the Ravens. They allowed over 180 yards to Nick Chubb. They... You know, offensively, besides Mark Andrews, nobody else really could make that many big plays. And I I just was very disappointed in how our defense played. And also how many missed tackles we had with Jarvis Landry, you know. And if he, and the Ravens fans would have bragged, well, we held Odell Beckham to two catches for 20 yards. That didn't matter. We still lost by 15 points. <laughs> but the reason why I'm taking the Ravens is just because of how bad the Steelers' offense is. You know, I don't know how they're going to do against the Bengals tonight. I think that they should be able to do enough. Because Mike Tomlin, in his career against the Bengals, is 20-5 and all time against them. And I believe he's undefeated with them without having Big Ben there. Because I remember definitely uh, there, there was one game, or even by Andy Dalton there, you know, he was still able to beat up the, you know, the A.J. McCarrens and other quarterbacks out there. But I'm taking the Ravens here just because I feel like the Pittsburgh offense, I think our secondary can do enough to uh, shut down Juju. Yeah, that's all we need to double team is Juju because they really have nobody else offensively to worry about. I think James Conner, who you know has been banged up and it hasn't been 100%, he won't be able to run as much through the uh, Baltimore defensive line because I think he's not, as, he's not nearly as good as Chubb. Yeah, he's not nearly as good as Chubb. And I just think, again, the Ravens, I think Lamar, you know, we have we do have the number one offense in the league still. We did put up 25 points. I think we could put up 20 to 28 points on the Steeler, de- Steeler defense. I think that should be enough to win the game against Steeler defense that has been uh, incredibly bad uh, over the last uh, couple weeks. But the, the reason why I'm taking the Steelers plus four, here is a very interesting stat that everybody needs to realize. 11 of the last 21 games between the Ravens and Steelers have been decided by four points or less. So this is a four-point spread when it came out. So I took Pittsburgh plus four because you, with this division rivalry, you can throw records out the window. These are two teams that know each other incredibly well. They're you know battle-tested. They've had plenty of close games, too many close games to count over the years. So I thought I took the Steelers plus four. I would not be surprised if Pittsburgh could make it a game, or even if they won, of how bad our defense is playing over the last couple weeks. Um, I think I, I think it will be a fun game because Ravens Steeler games are always fun. I'm taking the Ravens here, a little bit more talented. Uh, Lamar should have a bounce back game, and I think the Ravens are going to get back to their identity. We have the number one running game in the NFL, and I think we'll control the clock. We'll not get Mason Rudolph off the ball, and we'll win this game uh, to get our second straight win in Pittsburgh. When I don't remember the last time that's happened for us, where. Or since uh, twenty, uh, yeah, or second straight win in Pittsburgh, I think. Um, and somebody can maybe look it up. When was the last time the Ravens won back to back games at Pittsburgh uh, in the Ravens Steelers series? So that's why I like Baltimore here straight up. But I'll take Pittsburgh plus four. The next game, the 
Patriots over the Redskins. This one... <sighs> New England's the number one defense in six categories. The Pats defense has had multiple picks in three... Or Devin McCourty's had an interception in four games. They've had multiple picks in two of... Or I, I believe in three of the four games... This is the best defense in a National Football League, bar none. Definitely the best secondary in the league. If you want to say Bears, sure. But this Pats defense is, is remarkable. They've only had one offensive touchdown given up on them through four games. And, and that, by the way, was just a QB dive that was automatically a fumble right when it ended. And they're playing Washington, like I said. Haskins is 9-17 for 107 yards. I remember there was a stat where I think they said Belichick against quarterbacks making their first starts. Nobody has ever beaten them. And the stats are just god-awful. So, you know, this is a game for me with Dwayne Haskins going into this environment with Josh Norman going down to injury, with a few of the other Redskin players not being there, Jordan Reed still not being there, Terry McLaurin dealing with a hamstring injury. This is going to be an ugly game for New, uh, for Washington to go through. Do I think Brady will play better? Sure. I think, you know, if you look at where the Cowboys played against the Redskins, the Bears played against the Redskins, the New England Patriots should be able to move the ball up and down the field on the Redskins' defense because everybody has been able to for the most part. Um, And do I think this game is even going to be competitive? No. In fact, I, w- I want Jay Gruden fired today. Jay Gruden in all- this year has been so bad. In every phase of the game, especially defensively, where they have most of their talent, that they can't do anything, and it just stuns me that he still has a job. But I'm, you know, I think Colt McCoy could get in, but I don't think that matters. You know, the the Pats, you know, they they should be able to try to get a running game, or just kind of like before. I think if the Pats score 16 or 14 points, that should be enough because I don't think the Redskins will be able to put up two touchdowns against uh, this defense. This is this is the, the white battle of the week. I think the Jets then play next week. They they host the Jets again, so it's really not a you know great thing for them in that way. But we'll see. But I'm taking the Patriots here. Just clearly the, the best team in the league against the worst team in the NFC. Nothing else has to be said. So that's why I like New England here minus 14 and a half, and New England straight up. The next game, uh, the Panthers over the Jaguars. I already mentioned about Kyle Allen being coming the first third quarterback since Hostetler and Mahomes to win their uh, to win home games uh, to win road games in his first three starts. Um, but I like the Panthers here because I re- I've been more impressed with the Panthers, especially against a team like Houston, which is incredibly talented up and down the board. Um, definitely with running back, quarterback, wide receivers. Um, maybe not tight end, but definitely defensively. Uh, if you can out defend the Houston Texans defense, who has JJ Watts, Scarlett, Whitney Merciless, uh, Bradley Roby, uh, Andre Howe, and all those great Houston defenders, that that's telling me something. And if you look at to to me here, uh, Leonard, uh, you know. That's just kind of where I have the issue with that. I, like, to me, this game, if this game was in Jacksonville, I would have taken Jacksonville to win. Like I said, this is the ultimate toss-up game of the week for me here. Uh, this is why I hedged my bet with this one, because the Jags, look, four of their seven wins against Denver in, the, in their franchise history have been by three points or less. And Gardner Minshew Mania, what a great game he had. And boy, did he pull out some big, you know, big-time throws and big escapes that, again, I will tell people... You know, whoever wins this game, the mania behind them, Gardner Minshew's or Kyle Allen's, will continue to grow. Um, I even think Gardner Minshew, you know, depending on how he does, if, like if he wins, I don't think Nick Foles will be needed in, in Jacksonville because I'm going to trust Gardner Minshew, you know, playing effective football. Um, but I'm going to take the Panthers here. I think they'll be able to run the ball effectively. Um, I think that the Panthers have better offensive weapons. They have a better defense. And I don't think Gardner Minshew will be able to hold up as well as he did against Denver. And I'll just trust, you know, Kyle Allen's efficiency against Gardner Minshew's. Um, Gardner Minshew, I I don't think has, I think he's thrown, I don't think he has a pick. Let me see here. Let's see. Uh, 
Oh no 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 no. He does have a pick. He he does have a pick, and he does have three fumbles. I don't think Kyle or Ky- Kyle Allen only has fumbles. So uh, Kyle Allen has committed less turnovers, which I think is a big plus for the Panthers there. And I just I think the Panthers are playing much more effective style of football, and they've uh, compared to the uh, Jags. And I'll trust Sype here in a kicking game if it comes down to that in a close one. Should be a great game. Definitely the backup quarterback mania between these two. Somebody will get to go to that for another week. But I'm going to take the Panthers here. They're home. They're a little bit more talented. And I just think Kyle Allen's playing much better, or been, been playing better than Minshew. And I think Minshew will make one mistake, which will be the difference in the game. So that's why I like Carolina here straight up, but Jackson will plus three and a half. The next game, the Texans over the Falcons. Atlanta's 21st in points. <laughs> Atlanta is 21st in points. Matt Ryan has the second most picks, I think, in the league with... Or he might be, be his second most or, uh, tied with picks. The Falcons' defense just really hasn't done anything. And even though the Texans' offensive line is awful and Sean Watson got hit about a dozen times yesterday, I think the Houston Texans' offense will be able to much, move the ball much more effectively against this Falcons' defense compared to the Titans' defense, which showed up to play. Could the game be interesting? Sure. You know, I think Atlanta's defensive line, they got talent too. Basically, to me, I think this game's in Houston, and I'll trust the home field advantage there in that game. And I, I just I don't trust Atlanta's defense. That back end has been so awful that DeAndre Hopkins, you know, Kenny Stills, if he can be healthy, and any receiver, Kiki Kuti, and all those other receivers, they can have a field day on them, and they will be able to move the ball. And I don't think I don't think with Houston's defense of how effective they were against Carolina. They can do the same thing against Atlanta and win this game in a gritty, tough, physical way. Or I just think again, or if it has to come to a shootout, I think Deshaun Watson outshoots Matt Ryan in a game where um, it's close. Or, you know, I'll trust Deshaun in his offense compared to Matt Ryan in his, just with how well they've been playing through the first quarter of the year. So that's why I like Houston here minus five and Houston straight up. The next game, the Chargers over the Broncos. This is one where the Chargers, they they played more effective football. They have won games. And I look at the Chargers and go, you know, yeah, they were in a dogfight with Miami through 60-65% of that game, but they ended up winning that game by 20 points. If you look at how the Chargers have been playing, uh, they didn't have Mike Williams. They didn't have Travis Benjamin. Melvin Gordon didn't play at all, so we should see Melvin Gordon uh, back this week in a more full sense. Uh, Melvin Ingram left the game in the first quarter. Hopefully he'll be okay. But I just think with how Denver's been playing, Denver's been one of the most snake bitten teams in both their home games this year. They've um, given up last-second field goals by Eddie Panero and Josh Lambeau. And, you know, maybe that could be an advantage for the Broncos because if you're telling Thomas Long uh, to kick, because I haven't seen Mike Badgley uh, play all year, I think that could be, that could be a problem. But... I just really like how the Chargers are playing. They're going to they're gonna get Melvin Gordon back, and I think they'll be able to run the ball through the Denver defense, and I think Phillip Rivers with his offensive weapons, they'll be able to make enough plays with Dontrell Inman, Keenan Allen, uh, Virgil Green, and other offensive weapons to win this game in a tight one. And Phillip Rivers routinely has had a good amount of success in Denver over his career. Or no, I'm sorry. Also, he wants revenge. The game's in, in Los Angeles. Uh, he once revenged what happened last year where Case Keenum won the game off a last-second McManus field goal. I think that he still remembers that. I think he wants to take redemption on the on the Broncos for that happening. And I just I just trust the Chargers team a lot more. It's a more complete team, and it's more effective uh, in this situation. So, But I, I'm, I'm going to take Denver here plus 6.5 just because of the Chargers' uh, raft of injuries on the offensive and defensive sides of the ball. Denver can definitely keep it close. They can, they can hang on. And they should be able to make it within a score game. But I'll take the Chargers here to win because I, I, I trust um, Rivers to play a little bit better than Flacco in key spots. So that's why I like the char- uh, the Chargers here straight up. It'll take the Broncos plus six and a half. Uh, the next game, the Packers over the Cowboys. Um, Dallas is now 69-4 and in games where they didn't give up a touchdown. And for Dallas, this is only the third time in uh, their franchise history that they lost a game where they gave that they did not give up a touchdown, but they scored a touchdown. The other two incidents were Week Four and Week Seven of the 2002 NFL season. 
Um, and you know what? This game, it, it's really hard because th- this is the game of the week for me. And again, this is another hedging of the, you know, a bet game. If somebody took Green Bay on the line or Green Bay straight up, or well, if, Green, if somebody took Green Bay on the line but Dallas straight up, I would not fault you for that. I think honestly, either team could win this game and it wouldn't be surprising. Um, the, the biggest weakness for Green Bay, obviously, is their running defense. One of the worst in the league. They let Dalvin Cook almost run for 200. Uh, Miles Sanders and Howard ran for about another 170. And Philip Lindsay had about 120, 130 yards in three of their four games. Um, and with Dallas, you know, Amari Cooper got shut down. Dak Prescott really had one of his most ineffective game. I already told you about the Zeke stats. But I'm taking the... Um, Packers here just because they have the better quarterback. In the games uh, between Rodgers and Prescott, I believe Rodgers has won two of the three. He's 2-1 and one against Prescott. Um, or 1-1 one and one, and in 17 they didn't play him. And 18 yet. Yeah, you know, no. So, they, they're, you know, they, they split the last two games in this series, and I trust Rodgers enough in this to win. Also, Tyron Smith going down is huge, especially against the Smith brothers uh, and their Green Bay pass rush, which is much more improved. And with Michael Gallup maybe probably being out again and Amari Cooper battling with an injury, I don't think the Dallas offense will be nearly as effective uh, through the air. And unless Zeke has a monster game, which he could, I just don't see Dak making less plays than Rodgers. And that was the big thing for me why I took the Packers to win this game. I'm going to trust Aaron Rodgers here to make a few more throws compared to Dak Prescott. So that's why I like Green Bay here, plus four, and Green Bay straight up. Then The final two games, uh, the Chiefs over the Colts. This is one where, for for Mahomes, or for the Chiefs, this is, I believe, their third or fourth straight year with a 4-0 start. They have been fantastic. The fourth time Mahomes has not scored a touchdown, and he's won all those games. Uh, and the Chiefs... Um, have had 25 straight games of 24 or more points, and that is remarkable knowing that Patrick Mahomes put up 30-plus points and he didn't even throw a touchdown. Um, and uh, ironically, one of those games that he won last year was against his Indianapolis team where they put up 31 points. Um, I'm going to take the Chiefs here because, you know, I just I trust that offense. And after seeing how bad the rate, how many points the, the Colts gave up to the Raiders, the Chiefs can do that and then some. So if they play like that, the Chiefs can put up probably 40 or 50 points on the Colts um, to win this game. I thought they really couldn't run the ball that well. Uh, They missed T.Y. Hilton. The other receivers really couldn't get open. And if Derek Carr can shred your defense with Tyrell Williams, uh, with Miko Hardman, Sammy Watkins, Demarcus Robinson, Kelsey, the Chiefs can definitely do that. And Mahomes only lost one home game his entire career. Or he's uh, 7-1 at home. Yeah. In his career, but I'm taking uh, I'm going to take the Colts here plus ten because just like with the Chargers, that Chiefs defense is not good. Stafford had a field day, 300 plus yards and three TDs, and I don't think that the Colts are going to look as bad. But so they'll be able to backdoor cover like they did against Indy. And the Colts have the, the Colts haven't lost by ten uh, all year this year. Um, so that's why I like the uh, Chiefs here straight up. But I'll take the Colts plus ten. And finally, the Niners over the Browns. The Niners are looking for their first 4-0 start since 1990 uh, when they lost the NFC Championship game. Um, and here was the biggest stat why I took them. Um, the Niners have forced the second most turnovers in the league. Baker is tied with Jared Goff uh, for the most uh, picks in the league with six. And I think that Garoppolo and that offense could do en- should do enough uh, to win this game. They won a game with five turnovers from their offense. I don't think they're going to have that again. And they're going up against a tough task because the Niners... Have not won after their bye week since 2011. They're 0-6-1 in their last seven games after the bye. But I'll trust the Niners rest here. And I'll trust that the Browns are going to be a little too cocky after getting the first place in the division. And I think the Niners will win. But just like a lot of the other games this week, this is a really close one. So I'm take, that's why I'm taking Cleveland here plus three in this situation. Because I think Cleveland could win and it could be just that close. So those are my thoughts for this week and my picks. Like, comment, rate, subscribe. Please check out the NFL YouTube Prognosticators page and check out all the other great prognosticators. And until next week, this is Matt the Alpha Fanatic signing off. Until next time, so long.